or hard stance on Iran, President Trump laying down a tough message yesterday to Tehran at the U.N. General Assembly, urging nations not to tolerate the country's aggressive agenda. Watch. Iran's leaders sow chaos, death, and destruction. Iran's neighbors have paid a heavy toll for the region's agenda of aggression and expansion. We ask all nations to isolate Iran's regime as long as its aggression continues. And we ask all nations to support Iran's people as they struggle to reclaim their religious and righteous destiny. The president will head back to the U.N. this morning where he will chair a key meeting on Iran and denuclearization. Joining us now to discuss is former policy advisor to President George W. Bush, Paul Bonicelli. Paul, good to see you. Thanks so much for joining us. Hi, Maria. What Thanks. kind of an impact is all of this having, the, the U.N. meetings? What do you want to hear from the president today and what impact might it have? I think it's having a very good impact. You know, this is the second time he's done this, and so you combine his almost two years of foreign policy so far with this very clear speech. I think it was uh, even better than the last time. The tone was fine, um, but the themes he repeats over and over really are uh, making clear his foreign policy approach, which is national sovereignty comes first. And that's not because of xenophobia or isolation. That's because every single nation, whether the government is elected or not, is, is operating in the world to defend the interest of their own country. Mm. And so that's a refreshing uh, look at things, and it's how you cooperate. It's in honesty. And the United Nations is not a place where people focus on the realities every day and the honesty every day. Uh, they tend to get into this fantasy that there is somehow an international community that sits above the rest of the nations and that there's a structure where they can all sort of move along in a herd pack. That is not true. It's never happened. Uh, from the very beginning, the most steely-eyed realist that ever existed was Joseph Stalin, and he certainly didn't expect the U.N. to tell him what to do. So yeah. the president's uh, message, I think, was very good. Marie Har, former State Department, your thoughts? Yeah, so, Paul, I have a question for you about the Iran session today and what message you're looking to hear from the president. He is clearly uh, laying out a tough line. He doesn't like the Iran deal. He withdrew the United States from it. But he hasn't yet outlined a proactive, detailed policy to replace it. Does he want to go back to negotiations over the nuclear program? Does he want to include terrorism or support for the Houthi in those discussions, for example? I think the world will be listening today for specifics behind the rhetoric. What do you hope to hear from him today on those specifics? What should that policy look like? Well, I'm not quite sure we're going to get that because, of course, the talk is the, the change of the meeting uh, agenda is going to be much more about proliferation and larger so that uh, it's not just the president sitting there dealing with uh, everybody who's mad he got out of the deal and then the potential of Iran being there if they're talked specifically about. So the agenda's changed somewhat. I think that you'll see a detailed uh, Iranian plan come separate from the United Nations uh, because the president doesn't believe the United Nations is the place to make that happen. It will be along the lines that Bolton has talked about in Pompeo and the president, Nikki Haley, which is not really hard to figure out. They have to stop being the horrible actor that they are in the world and sit down and cooperate with the United States. And I think that's why he highlights his relationship with Kim Jong-un. If you're willing to stop being a horrible actor and talk with me, we can start working out a deal that's mutually acceptable. Iran has not even taken one step in that direction, partly because they believe in the fantasy that Europe will somehow save them and save this deal. And I think even Europe knows they're doing nothing more than face saving at this point. Yeah, actually, Paul, I wanted to ask you about Europe because the EU announced yesterday that they, they're planning to open um, a special way, a special payment channel for companies in Europe to actually make legal payments to Iran so they can do business with them. Um, is that actually possible? And how is the Trump administration going to react to that? Well, good luck to the Europeans. Uh, it's no coincidence that they chose yesterday to make that announcement. I really do believe they're trying to save face. Uh, the United States is far too powerful in the world economically and commercially uh, for anybody to break our sanctions and pay no price for it. All we need to do is look at all of the companies that are already getting out of business with Iran uh, and telling their, their home governments, stop trying to pressure us and figure out ways for us to do uh, business with Iran when the United States doesn't want that to happen. It's not worth it. So I think Europe is 
not going to come up with a mechanism that's going to be very effective. And if they do, John Bolton has been very clear, we will oppose that. We will make people pay for violating our sanctions, precisely because we believe life and death is in the balance when a country like Iran is pursuing nuclear weapons and destroying people and property all around the world through terrorism. Uh, Paul, what's interesting, if you, when I listen to President Trump, I always hear a businessman who wants to know what we're getting for our money. All the money that is being, that was sent to Iran in terms of cash, in terms of the sanctions relief, what did we get for that? What do we get for the money that we use, that we send to, uh, that, that we spend on defense when we spend more of our GDP than other nations in, in NATO? That's how I listen to it. And I think that that is a perfectly legitimate way to approach our relations with the rest of the world. Yeah, I, I know exactly what you mean. Uh, the people that stand out as being very effective at the United Nations, Nations for the sake of U.S. interests have been people like Gene Kirkpatrick. They've been people like Senator Jesse Helms, the late Jesse Helms. Uh, Nikki Haley expresses herself this way, and so does the president. The president does it, as you rightly say, because his business background makes him think in terms of the bottom line, which is how most people think who are not diplomats or spent their life in the Foreign Service. And I don't say that with uh, bitterness. I've spent a lot of time in government around Foreign Service officers. I appreciate what they do, uh, but they do not see the U.N. the way most people would see it, which is, what do we get out of this? Can we cooperate? Can we work together? That's great. That's what the Security Council exists for, and that's really the only most, it's the most important element of the U.N. But everybody else is going to ask that question, and he comes at it with that notion. And it's worth considering, uh, because every other nation is there for their nation state, not for the international community. L let's talk uh, Korea for a moment. South Korean President Moon Jae-in remains optimistic about North Korea's uh, denuclearization, as well as that second summit with the United States. He spoke with Fox News' Brett Baer yesterday. Listen to this. Got to get your reaction. Chairman Kim uh, has a great, uh, has unwavering trust and expectations for President Trump, and uh, he is also aware that um, the complete denuclearization of North Korea, uh, such a, a major feat, can only be achieved by someone like President Trump. So, in order to uh, make progress, he wants to have the second U.S.-North Korea summit as soon as possible. Your thoughts on the second summit, and of course, the president yesterday officiated that deal with South Korea on trade. Uh, the importance there, Paul? Yeah, I think the South Korean president's words were very important. If we listen to him, he is saying the same kinds of things that the United States, that the president is saying about the end goal, which is denuclearization. Now, we all know that Kim Jong un does not want denuclearization if he can help it. He does not want to give up. The one thing that gives him power and prestige and, frankly, the ability to survive in an environment that he's made very hostile to himself, and that includes China. China's not thrilled with North Korea. They created somewhat of a rabid dog that they would like to see tamed down a bit. Uh, but the South Korean president approaches it differently from President Trump. He's going to be much more conciliatory. He has is a man from the left. He, he thinks that things can work out usually better than they possibly can. But I think this shows the South Koreans and the United States are on the same page, and Kim Jong-un goes very slowly, dragging his feet, and will eventually get to a deal if the United States remains tough on him, and I think this president will. All right, we'll leave it there on that note. Paul, thanks very much for weighing in this morning. Good to see you, sir.